Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jaak Villa. I'm heading here the computer science department and, and bioinformatics activities. Uh, I'm so happy to have, uh, after the corona now, the physical meeting in here. And I'm even more so happy to have two outstanding scientists from Europe. Uh, luckily, uh, both why they both are here tomorrow today is that tomorrow we have this uh, honorary doctorate uh, event, so they will be conferred as honorary doctors, and that's why we could have this uh, physical event in here. So we will have Yvonne Bernie and Mart Sarma uh, giving us <laughs> applause. Um, giving us some inspiration uh, for uh, science. We have very good representation from different uh, faculties and institutes in here. Uh, I counted at least seven, eight members of Academy of uh, Sciences of Estonia in here. Uh, so this is very, very good. And we will also make the video uh, recording in here for, of, the, of the presentations. Um, we invited uh, 4 p.m. Uh, 16.00, so that's why we start a little bit unconventionally, uh, not quarter past, but at 4 o'clock sharp. Uh, so if somebody comes in at, uh, in 10 minutes from now, uh, so they are traditionalists uh, of the University of Tartu. Uh, so let's uh, uh, give them a big applause then when they come in, but that's fine. So uh, we have two... Uh, presentations. Um, we can spend here uh, up to uh, two hours or, or less. It depends how many questions you have, how much uh, we can have the interaction in here. Uh, but, but we will have the presentations. Uh, so first, you and Bernie. Um, I don't know where to start. So he's uh, from Eton College high school, Oxford University uh, degree, and next to Cambridge, Sanger Institute, Cambridge, PhD. Um, I know, uh, I think we met in, in Greece, in ISMB, in Halkidiki. So we were both uh, PhD students at the time, and Yuman uh, was uh, um, having a blast in there. Um, he has been involved in all the genomic sequencing, interpretation of full genomes, activities, understanding where the genes are, all the different uh, coding elements, etc. cetera. Uh, now he is director of European Bioinformatics Institute and deputy uh, director of EMBL. So EBI is part of EMBL. Uh, as director of EBI, he is also deputy director general of EMBL. Uh, and Estonia is in the process of getting into the family of EMBL as well. Uh, how many different prizes uh, you have been awarded and is the commander of the British Empire? Uh, so uh, uh, highly, highly uh, recognized in the, in the field, not only because of the individual um, scientific merits, but also all the organizational work that uh, Yuvana is managing to bring together people, take the same uh, goals, achieve those goals in many, many different uh, global activities as, um, yeah, uh, what are you now, uh, uh, this Global Alliance for um, Genomics and Health, um, on the board of Genomics England, uh, and and uh, I don't want to start looking from the paper in here. Uh, but too many to mention. Uh, but it's not the prizes that make uh, people outstanding. Uh, it's who they are themselves. And I did mention that I know even for a long time. We, we have even been in one of the joint um, EU Network of Excellence uh, project that he was leading. So uh, UNFAN project was where we uh, participated in, uh, in my research group, several PhD students got uh, wings into their research, uh, doing systems biology and network uh, analysis of biology. Um, so this is a little bit of background, and I'm so happy to have Yuvan here and present 
EMBL and his current activities and take on the on the genomics versus medicine, you, you say what? Please, you want. Um, uh, when I told my son uh, that I was becoming, I was going to go to the palace, Buckingham Palace, and be awarded commander of the British Empire, he did say the commander of the British Empire, and I had to explain to him that there are many commanders of the British Empire, and that the British Empire is not that big. Uh, 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 so he should, you know, take, take all of that with a grain of salt. Um, but thank you for that introduction, Yak. Um, uh, so really, this talk has sort of two parts. There's a part that introduces Amble, and for some people who know Amble, maybe tell you where we're going and what's going to happen next. And for the people who don't know Amble, it will be an introduction to the wonderful world that Estonia is about to join. And then I'm going to really focus on three stories which all illustrate a particular theme of how um, routine operational data is becoming closer and closer with research data. And by that feature of bringing routine data with research data, you can make new discoveries. Um, I'm going to use healthcare, but in fact, it's generic beyond healthcare, this uh, aspect. Yep, perfect. So just an introduction to EMBL. EMBL is the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. We are a, a, not a child of the 60s. So post the Second World War, Europe developed a number of scientific institutions that spanned multiple countries. Perhaps the most famous is CERN. We are a kind of child of CERN, because at the same, after they set up CERN, many of the people realized that they would like to have a focus in molecular biology. And that comes with two components. One was to do excellent molecular biology research. But back then in the 60s, it was clear that these new physics devices, these new types of light and these new types of particles, were going to be very, very interesting for biology. And so uh, EMBL was founded. I'm going to use this WYSI system. Let's see if I can make it work. EMBL was uh, started in Heidelberg, Germany, but immediately had outstations in Hamburg and Grenoble, where there are synchrotrons, uh, these uh, very fast-moving electrons, which release incredibly pure and coherent x-rays. The best way to look at a bunch of different proteins is using those x-rays. Now, that was in the 70s. Uh, later on in the 80s, um, what happened was that in Heidelberg, there was the growth of storing data for biology. So literally, this was the library at EMBL. They was realizing that data was being published in papers, and they employed people to type in the DNA sequences that they read from papers and place it onto a disk, well, onto a computer system. And you could order the data library, and it came in a couple of formats. It came in a magnetic tape format, or you could order it as books. So you could order all the world's DNA in book format and line the books up in your office and leaf through them. Um, now, <clears throat> in the late 80s, it was becoming clear that this was not going to scale well in the library. And so they uh, put their hands up uh, at EMBL and said, we need an, uh, a bigger building. And EMBL is founded by a number of countries. And the countries said, well, we already have two sites, one in Hamburg, Germany, and one in Grenoble, France. As alongside Heidelberg, and so we, um, they had a competition between countries about where uh, Europe's biological data library would be kept, uh, the European Bioinformatics Institute. And three countries competed. Uh, Germany, they would build a, another building next door to Heidelberg, to the site in Heidelberg. Um, Uppsala, Sweden, which would have been rather lovely, um, uh, uh, with that um, seat of learning in Sweden, and of course, I know that this is the second oldest uh, university after Uppsala um, in, um, in the Baltic region. Nobody has failed to mention that <laughs> to me at every point. I also now know how to tease a Finnish person by pointing out that Tartu is slightly older than Turku. Um, and uh, 
the third country to, to compete was the UK. And they said that the, the Wellcome Trust, which is a big charity in the UK, had committed to build a building for sequencing the human genome, basically in the outskirts of Cambridge. It's a little village called Hingston. And so the UK's bid was to build the European Bioinformatics Institute next door to that building. And that's precise, that's why the EBI is where it is there. Now, later on in the 90s, um, uh, Rome uh, was founded as another outstation focusing on mouse biology and now on epigenetics and neurobiology. And then in two th just in 2017, um, the final site, Barcelona, has been added. And that's on this amazing building, which is on the beach. It's really lovely. Uh, and they focus on tissue engineering. We are owned, we're a legal entity, an international treaty organization. We're treated like a miniature embassy inside of each of these countries. So we are our own legal entity, and we are governed by the countries uh, shown in gray here. And you can see that Estonia is uh, in gray stripes along with Latvia, and that is because you have almost joined the family. And the Emble side has agreed, and uh, the Estonian side, I think, just has to sign a document now. Uh, and then you join this wonderful family um, supporting these different places. One of the ways to visualize this, by the way, is you can imagine a little Estonian flag going in on those six different sites. Emble EBI will be part of Estonia, Heidelberg will be part of Estonia, Hamburg will be part of Estonia, and the scientists across Estonia can come and use the resources here at EMBL uh, to further their research. And that goes back to these two key missions. So one mission is to do excellent research. And there was a big concern in the 1970s that the, the research capacity was going to be dragged over to the US. And they wanted a vibrant beacon in Europe to keep people in Europe. But the second aspect, and it's become just as important, has been access to these scientific services. And so these are synchrotrons, in particular in Hamburg and Grenoble, for X-ray crystallography and for X-ray imaging. So there's a whole new world of X-ray imaging. For um, uh, high-end electron microscopes and correlative light microscopes in Embel Heidelberg, and then in the data resources at Embel EBI. And that is, those services are something that we provide, um, in our case at the EBI, to the world. But we have a particular focus on providing them to our EMBL um, nations. And for these uh, experimental services, uh, if you want access to them, you put your hand up, apply, and they take the best science from the EMBL uh, member states to go on the synchrotrons or on the... Um, on the uh, electron microscopes. So um, I think probably you can apply now because you're a prospect member. So if you do, in particular, if there's anybody here who has imaging uh, and electron microscopy, I really encourage you to think about Emble Heidelberg as a place to uh, explore your, your sample or your data. We um, are funded in five-year um, uh, stages, uh, and our Director General, Edith Hurd, she is new. Um, this is uh, just last year we agreed with the different countries our new um, scientific program and indicative scheme, which is the money side. And as well as being rooted to our molecular um, basis at EMBL, that is, what is the molecular basis of life, how do molecules work? How do they make cells? And how do they make organisms? Edith wants us to get out of the lab and to explore life in its natural context. So explore life where it happens. Now, what does that mean? It's these new areas such as planetary biology. There's an ambitious goal to uh, sequence, directly do metagenomic sequencing in many, many different ecological settings coordinated between the ocean and the uh, shore. And so there's a uh, truck that is going to come around Europe and visit different parts of Europe 
to do this joint sampling of life in these different settings. Another aspect which I will mention more about is human ecosystems, which is how do humans interact both with the environment around them and with themselves. And then something which has become a really big part of the last two years has been infection biology. So how do parasites, bacteria, and other infectious agents interact in particular with us and give rise to disease? So in the new scheme, we have these different broader focuses still remaining molecular, but trying to apply it to these broader areas. And at the same time, the other aspects um, that EMBL has been tremendously powerful in has been something which is very relevant to this um, setting, data sciences and theory. So biology has largely become a data-driven science. It's very hard, in fact, I think it's impossible realistically for humans that, that there aren't sort of elegant physics theories for biology. One simply has to hold an, an awful lot of observations about how biological systems work, and then one has to derive useful aspects from those uh, observations. And that is really the realm of data science and, of, um, uh, and associated with it, theory, theory now of complexity, of how these complex systems work, of what you can expect um, when things are set up in a particular way. And at EMBL EBI, so we're one part of EMBL, we aim to deliver on the same five missions of EMBL overall, but in this area of data science and research. Yak was a student there. Um, uh, I was a, a, um, a student next door, and then I transferred over to EMBL EBI. So we currently hold the world's largest open data resource in biology which we make available to the world, and we coordinate it with our colleagues in America and in Asia, in particular Japan. So every night, these large data sets are synchronized worldwide, and scientists from around the world publish, when they publish their paper, the convention in molecular biology, which is usually held to, is that you must simultaneously publish your data to these databases. Uh, it includes DNA, RNA, proteins, protein structure, um, and uh, protein pathways, and the literature. Um, as well as delivering these data resources to everyone, uh, we also perform excellent research, um, and in particular, many of our researchers are now using AI in different flavors. Even a dinosaur like me is using AI in different flavors, and we have old uh, the old school machine learning or multivariate statistics still kind of coming along to make this work. And then just to go through these three other areas, missions, they're sort of the su supporting missions to these two key ones. We aim to train the next generation of scientists. And there's a particular rule at EMBL, which is uh, everybody must leave after nine years except for special people. There's, you're allowed to be ten percent of the people are allowed to be special. I am one of those special people, um, uh, but it's a legal requirement. This isn't just a desire from the um, from the management. It's not a it's not a aspirational goal. We are not allowed to have more than, as it happens, seventeen percent of our staff members. But in practice, it has to be below ten percent, going beyond nine years, and that means everybody who goes through EMBL expects to leave EMBL and go back, we hope, to the countries um, that they probably that they came from, but or some European country. For our postdocs and our graduate students, it's not even nine years, it's five years is the maximum they can be there. And we are not allowed to hire our graduate students directly into postdocs. So people must leave uh, between these uh, settings. So we take our training goals very, very seriously. And something that we've just added is something called the ARISE fellowships. And this is for something which physics does well, but biology has yet to do, I think, well, which is scientific engineers. 
So we now have a specific program for engineers who work in service delivery to come software engineers or technical people who run electron microscopes or synchrotrons can come and be trained um, or have a, have a two to three year process of being part of one of these high-end um, institutions. We engage very deeply with academic, uh, with, sorry, with industry, so um, everything we do is, it's, it's not based on whether you're academic or not, it's based on whether um, your science is good and then whether you're in an EMBL member state or not. And then finally, we help coordinate bioinformatics in Europe, and there's two components of that. EMBL is the legal host of a European process called Elixir, the Elixir Hub, and um, uh, the, the Estonian Elixir node is here um, in this building uh, somewhere, um, and is a way of making sure that we're distributing bioinformatics across Europe. And then Eurobioimaging is a similar process for the imaging technologies. And in both cases, EMBL is kind of the anchor partner uh, for those networks, so just the biggest part of those networks that deliver a large amount of infrastructure for Europe. Now I'm going to dive into a moment about um, some of the use of EMBL's data science actually in the pandemic, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, just to say there's more, I'm going to do a lot of data science here, uh, which I hope will fit the audience somewhat. Um, but there were lots of things we did over the two years. Like many, many institutions, when the pandemic hit, we pivoted quite hard into providing research. And I think the two really successful things are some of the data sides, which I'll mention, but also the structural biology side. And interestingly enough, um, still, still at the moment, the um, EMBL-SACS beamline is part of the quality control process for the development of the BioNTech uh, vaccine. Um, uh, we've done, I, I, w I can't talk through all of these bits of the slide, but what I'm going to now focus on is over here, which is the uh, data portal and the data science that we did. And for me, this I'm going to show you this slide a couple of different times. This is an example of us putting operational data sets alongside research data sets. And um, there are now multiple times where I've seen this happen, and I think it's a new theme for this century, which is that the digitization of what we do every day, and again, Estonia is a great country for this, means that there is an incredibly rich data stream which is available for many, many things that we're interested in. Now, in the case of... Um, COVID, this was RT-PCR testing, so testing who has the virus, and sequencing, sequencing what the, sequ the, the genetics of the virus was. The side which does the healthcare operations has to use this data often very quickly, sometimes within 24 hours. And so that side of the operation has to go very fast. Everything has to work. It must be robust. The analysis systems must be trusted and, and clear-cut, and uh, there is the goal there of delivering something, in this case, uh, public health uh, outputs. And yet that data set itself is incredibly useful for research, and even inside of the pandemic, we did lots of research during the pandemic about understanding the infection of SARS-CoV-2. Now, research does not work on a 24-hour basis. It's slower. It's more like weeks, um, perhaps months. You have these open-ended pieces of analysis. You don't know quite where the data is going to take you, so you have to be poised and think about it. It takes a different mindset than the delivery side. But it leads to really deep quality control on these data sets and an understanding of what is actually going on on the other side and, of course, creates new analysis schemes that you might want to roll out. So I'm going to give you one example here, which is viral genetics and genomics and epidemiology. And this is work from my colleague, Moritz Gerstung, who uh, was at EMBL EBI. He's now at DKFZ. Now, hopefully, oh, yes. So in this video, this is England, 
which Moritz was analyzing. And I'm going to show you the output of his model here. These are all the other SARS-CoV-2 lineages. On the left-hand side, you're going to see the rise of B117, which we now call alpha. And pretty much now, it starts in Kent and then suddenly takes over England. Now, the ability to make a picture like that about the inference of where different genomic variants were is harder than it looks. So to, to the underlying that picture is quite a sophisticated model that combines both the genomic sequence and infection levels. So not every positive case went for sequencing. In fact, usually a subset. And infections, there were positive cases that would never be sequenced as well. And both of these measures are noisy. And so you have to deal with a lot of noise in their system. They're noisy for all sorts of different reasons. And a simple denoising does not give you a good solution. So you can't just run it through some spline functions, some simple spline functions. So in this case, he built an actual infection model, susceptible, infected, recovered model, inside of the uh, ability to denoise the data. And that allowed him to produce the video that uh, I've just shown and many other features of what we believed was going on inside of England at the time. And probably the most important one here um, is up here, which is the rise here in red of alpha as a proportion of the variance over time. And there's a key question here, which is, is that due to epidemiological factors? In other words, is it kind of luck and people who were giving up on the pandemic's control at the time and transmitting it more? Or is it due to a biological property of the virus? And that will change your response. If it was due to the biological property of the virus, the control measures that you had previously were not going to work in the future. If it was due to a change in epidemiological behavior of humans, then you had to go back and redesign your policies about how humans would, um, uh, would be uh, meeting each other. Uh, this, by the way, is the, the rather long, these, these incredibly long numbers are how the phylogenetics community thinks about the SARS-CoV-2 variants. Um, actually, when this one first came about, this is when the WHO decided to give them Greek letters because there was no way you were going to get easy newspaper articles with B1.1.1255 and everybody remembering those things. So this lineage here got renamed as Alpha, B1.1.7. And the reason why was because of this red point up here where Alpha was about 50% more infectious biologically than the previous circulating viruses, uh, strains of SARS-CoV-2. Now, Moritz put that data together over Christmas in 2020 and coming up into January of 2021. And here in Estonia, I don't know, we had a, we had a very bad Christmas. And it had this uh, incredible moment where London was suddenly shut down, uh, but it was announced on lunchtime that London was going to shut at 6 p.m. Um, and then, of course, all the train stations immediately filled up and everybody tried to get out of London in those uh, six hours. But during that time, a key question again was, was this the fact that winter was here, that more people wanted to meet because it was Christmas? Was it an epidemiological basis? Or was it a biological question about the virus? And Moritz's data was a key data point to making that decision. And I actually got to present that as to the SAGE system and uh, it was part of the science package that went to the Prime Minister, um, the UK Prime Minister. My colleague, Rolf Apweiler, presented this to the Bundeskanzler Matt, the German Chancellery, uh, mid-January. I was part of the science advice package there. And I also presented to the Scientific Council leadership in France at the time. 
Um, and, you know, you, it was a very classic European moment where you know, the first thing they thought was the Brits had just messed it up again, and they, they were coming up with this virus called uh, B117 as an excuse for the disaster that was going on at the time. And so we had to, you know, I remember, um, thankfully, you know, one communicates science in English, so I didn't have to do this in French, but I remember saying, indeed, the Brits messed up an awful lot of things, but in this case, it is different, and here is the reason why. Now, Moritz and I, Moritz worked manically over Christmas 2020, and I think both Moritz and I thought that we would not do it ever again, <laughs> um, or it wouldn't happen again. But in fact, as we know, now know, this is a feature of these respiratory viruses. And back again in April of 2021, uh, March, April 2021, we had to do it all over again for this uh, virus called Delta, variant called Delta. This actually was a more complicated inference problem because, again, I don't know if people remember, but Delta did not originate in the UK. Delta originated in India, and it grew in India over time. And in fact, it split quite deeply in India. There were two different Delta lineages circulating in India. And it only came over to Europe in March to April of uh, 2021. And we had to deal with the travel of this virus from India versus whether it was truly biologically expanding and different from alpha. And uh, that's actually a very difficult thing to model. Um, and uh, uh, again, Moritz's model was one of the best models at separating out the biological factors from the epidemiological factors. So I'm, I'm worried now, because Yak mentioned I might lose many of you in this next one. <laughs> I might skip it. Um, um, but I thought it would, might be interesting to look at another aspect during the pandemic here. Um, how many of you are biologists? Okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with it. Right. Um, in, a, in an infection uh, scenario, you have your virus. One thing that's changing is your virus. But the other thing which is changing or can change are humans, the, the host. And the, host, the hosts are different. We respond differently to the viral infection. Now, one very obvious aspect is age. So basically, people below 40, really, they might have had a really tough week, but most people got through the infection even without the vaccine. Whereas people over 60 very often had a really, really tough time Many of them went into hospital, and a fair proportion of those died. The people who didn't die had an awfully horrible time in hospital. So we have a, a difference uh, due to humans, to, due to human physiological factors. But not only do we have a difference due to human physical, physiological factors um, due to our age, but we also have quite a big difference due to our genetics. And a number of people, when we take the genome of people who were infected with COVID or were in hospital with COVID, we could track down that they, were, they had different parts of their genome. And I'm actually not going to show you the, the most biggest signals here. I'm going to focus on one particular type of genomic variation, which is called copy number variation data. Think of the genome as a big book, like the book of Shakespeare, like Shakespeare's plays. Lots of the differences are just spelling differences. There's just a letter which is different somewhere. But some differences are like a whole page has been torn out or a whole page has been copied a couple of times. It's those tearing out or copying, which is, which is copy number variation, a big chunk of genome which has been copied multiple times. And it's notoriously difficult to estimate, actually. And in my lab, we have built one of the most robust ways of estimating copy number variation in the human genome. We've applied it to many situations, and we were going to apply we applied it to this COVID situation. And this is just showing uh, using 
a wonderful data set, the UK Biobank data set, that the copy number variation association works and this is looking at copy number associations to many, many different um, uh, um, known diseases like um, cancer or cardiac diseases or eye problems. And this plot, if you're a geneticist, is indication that our method works because it's well controlled at low p-values. And then for each disease, there's a point where it goes absolutely bonkers up. Uh, so that is a good... Uh, a good uh, setup. So we ran this method uh, for COVID, whether you were a pa whether somebody was a patient with COVID in hospital versus not in hospital. That was our contrast, and this is a very traditional way that people present the results of this association. Every point here is a point on the genome. So this is chromosome one, chromosome two, chromosome three, and the y-axis is the p-value. And you can see that this is a, is a very kind of slow bumping around. All of the genome is pretty flat. And we've got now these three big spikes. So the, let me just focus on the flatness. The flatness is the same thing that I pointed out before. For low p-values, we match the expected level of um, deviation from the null model. And so that's very reassuring. It means that our statistical test is well controlled, it's robust. And then obviously we've got these three massive peaks. And these three massive peaks lie over the three T-cell loci. So T-cells are part of your immune system, and they get, uh, they get randomized in three places across the genome to make the diversity of T-cells so your T-cells can recognize different viruses. Um, and just there's three, I'll come on, in some sense there's four, it's just two of them are side by side, so we, we say that there are three, but there are really four of them. Um, and when I first saw this uh, picture, I said to myself, oh, this is a positive control, uh, it's a bit boring, and that is because we know that T cells are involved in the COVID response, and we have picked up people from hospital who have, um, uh, who ha are having the, COVID, the disease, versus people who just have a mild form. They've just been in, they're infected and positive, but they're not going into hospital. And so this difference is simply the fact that when we take blood from people in hospital from COVID, they have much higher levels of T cells. So I was quite reassured about that. I was a bit annoyed that we had a very flat behavior below that. But thankfully, my uh, postdoc um, looked further into this. And I did not realize this, but there are two different types of T cells. The traditional T cells are called alpha beta T cells, and there is this enigmatic class of T cells called gamma delta T cells. And the gamma delta T cells, people don't know what they do that well. Maybe they're involved in mucus uh, and other aspects of the immune response in mucus. And um, what we could show here is that there was a very big difference in the ratio of the, alpha, of the gamma delta to alpha beta between mild and severe people. In other words, people with mild COVID have much higher levels of the gamma delta uh, T cell compartment than the alpha beta uh, one. And this is quite a roundabout way of doing that. Um, but nevertheless, it's quite an interesting observation that there's a particular part of the T cell response that is associated with COVID severity. So my final story here is work with um, the Public Health England and the Human um, uh, uh, Health Security Agency, Kong and Isabel. And this is using um, two features that we had in this operational data set. So the UK um, digitized its contact tracing. And so the people, when somebody was infected with COVID and they were positive, someone called them up and they were asked to record all the people that they could have passed COVID onto. And they were also asked to record, remember, 
five to seven days ago all the places they visited. Because five to seven days ago was where they were infected. So they, you think about who this person can infect, and that's called forward tracing, and then backward contact tracing is trying to work out where this person was infected um, uh, five days earlier. And this is made up data, you'll be pleased to hear. I'm not breaking any GDPR. So here's one individual who visited a shop. This is the UK way of rep representing postcodes. Visited a friend at this time, visited a hairdresser. And here's another individual, and maybe they visited a shop, but it's a different postcode. They went to hospital. They also visited a hairdresser. And notice I've deliberately made those two postcodes match. So this is a plausible pace where there's two people who are now positive, and seven days ago or six days ago, they had gone to the same place at the same time. And we combined that information with uh, one extra piece of information, which was very, very powerful. And that is that in a number of these viruses, in particular the alpha variant and the delta variant, there was either the presence or the absence of a deletion in the, the genome. And it just happened to be that the RT-PCR primers went over that deletion. So every test, each test used three RT-PCR primers. So they looked at three places across the genome. And when alpha was there, you would see two of them would be positive and one of them would be negative. When it wasn't alpha, all three would be positive, all three negative. So we end up with one bit of information about whether the, the RT-PCR test is compatible with, um, with an alpha variant. And what's interesting about that is that we can then go back to this uh, concordance uh, data set, uh, so this backward tracing data set, and try to work out in different possible places where people are infected, if they were infected by the same individual, they would either both be positive for this difference or both be negative. What they can't be is positive and negative. They can't be discordant. So for every setting, hairdressers, visiting friends, going to shops, going to hospitals, we can calculate how much concordance there is if one assumed that was the site of infection for those individuals. We could only do this when we get a crossover of about 50-50. Uh, there has to be enough of both types of viruses circulating in the population for this to be a useful method. And so we calculated precisely where those windows were um, in time when there was a, a switch between the alpha, uh, to switch to alpha, or in fact a switch back to delta. Um, and it's actually quite simple statistics. One just goes through to calculate your ex the expected level of concordance given the prevalence at the time. Um, and then one basically builds a, a massive chi-squared table or odds ratio uh, uh, of, of this. And so we were able to do something which has been very difficult to do in the pandemic, which is to get some estimate of where transmission was happening inside of the community. We always knew it was happening inside of households. So when one person in a family gets infected, very often other people in the family gets infected. I mean, it's pretty obvious. But uh, the, the trouble was is it was incredibly unclear where transmission was happening outside of the household. Now, this is not the total amount of transmission, but it's the odds ratio of whether the transmission comes from a single source. And let me do the two extremes first. So these are shops. And in shops, lots of people went to shops to do their shopping or to do some other things all the way through the pandemic. Many people were in the shop at the same time who ended up being positive. But it's the, the shops are very close to having uh, a, new, a sort of odds ratio of one, no difference to this concordance. They're the least likely to be single source. This one up here, which is called personal services, which sounds a bit dodgy, uh, but in fact is really hairdressers and nail bars. 
this is the place if two people, so being positive with COVID is rare, going to the hairdresser is rare. If two people are positive and they both went to the hair, same hairdresser six days beforehand, pretty much almost certainly they got infected at that hairdresser, uh, is what this is saying. And in between there, we have quite a range of different things. And actually, this one here, visiting friends and family, this is when somebody visits another family member. And the next one up is hot, somewhere up here is holidays. So this is a way of getting at a really important policy question, which is which settings do I close? A pandemic strikes. Do I close the shops? Well, actually, this tells you that you probably can keep the shops open. What you've probably got to do, you might want to close the hairdressers, but I remind you that going to the hairdressers is rare. We don't do it every day, so you'll probably get away with keeping the hairdressers open. Uh, but what you do have to tell people is please don't visit your friends and family, which is a much harder thing to do. Now, that policy is quite a hard thing to execute, um, but it's informative for the people making these decisions. And this is a little of a, a controlled data set. Um, the red is the, the same signal, and the blue is when we, rather than looking at concordance on the day, we look one day before or one day after. And the important thing here is the blue lines are all far, far lower and often cross one. And that's indicative that it really is specific to people being in the same place on the same day is, is uh, uh, so we really do believe it's about transmission. So I'm gonna go back to this loop. I've given you three examples here where, where the routine healthcare operation data has fed into research. And for research, we've been able to turn that around and deliver that back in some sense into operations. But it's not just public health. And in particular, I think genomic medicine is the same sort of process. So we are going to deliver pieces of genomic medicine for rare disease and for cancer, sequence people genomes to deliver them really good healthcare. But that data set in itself becomes a, re a resource for research. And I know Estonia here is one of the leaders between the biobank and the way you've set things up uh, to, to do this between the cohorts that you have. So uh, there are other countries which are on a, a slower path. Uh, towards all of this. But a really interesting thing here, perhaps for the Estonian perspective, is to, in some sense, the biobank uh, is a research process which feeds into healthcare. I think there's another business of taking the healthcare process to feed into research in the, other, in the uh, equal, and, uh, equal direction. Um, and I, there was meant to be a slide in between there, um, which is, uh, Genomic medicine is one of the things in the new EMBL program, and we are very, very happy at EMBL to share all of the technology that we've developed and our experience uh, to help make that useful for people. So I have given a rather focused talk um, <laughs> on topics, but with a broad start and end. And I'm, thank you very much for listening. And I'm also very, very happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let's use microphone. Micro Thank you very much. You know, let's have a dream. I have a dream. Okay. Uh, and you also. If you had like 80% of uh, UK people genotyped and you have a array data, imputed array data, what would be uh, what happened differently? What would you do differently if you had this data before, or let's say first day when the pandemic started? Oh, first day before the pandemic. I mean, I, we did think, <laughs> we did write down how much would it cost to genotype the whole of the UK population. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, um, and use that for risk stratification. And, and it definitely, I mean, actually for, for COVID, it, it would have, if we had genotyped them already, the genetics would have definitely helped risk stratification. There are one or two loci. I, I, mean, I mean, COVID actually has a relatively large um, genetic component to it. Um, 
you know, the practicalities of it is, is that you can't genotype 66 million people in, 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 a, in, in a sensible number of months, and it costs too much. I mean, the other side of this dream, it's a dream I think we share, is to, I am really keen, and I'm very, very proud of seeing the genomes being used inside of healthcare systems to deliver better care. And that's, for me, less about the pandemic and more about rare disease and cancer. And both of those are really clear that it works. It, it really works. So 2% of children are born with a suspected rare disease. If you sequence them and their parents, around 30% of the time you make a diagnosis, about 5% of that 30%, you profoundly change the outcome of the child. For all of the people you make a diagnosis, you really profoundly change the family um, um, happiness and ability to manage with the disease. And then with cancer, one in two of us will have a diagnosis of cancer. It's a bit depressing, uh, but still. And um, when the genome is sequenced, there's a growing number of drugs where you can say, for this, for this cancer that you've got, this drug will work particularly well. I can't promise that it works, but it works particularly well. Both of those drivers mean I think we will end up with genomic information across, for healthcare reasons, across the entire population. Ah, so, so I don't rely on common disease as the reason the healthcare system do, does it, but I do believe that we can change some of the risk profiling for common disease in particular cardiovascular, for the things we do screening for now. So because we do screening for cardiovascular and we do screening, I don't actually know how it works in Estonia, but in the UK we do screening for breast cancer, we already make a decision about who we send for screening. And now it's, it's sort of just a question of doing the stats right. Can you improve that decision about who you send for screening or who you send for follow-up? And it seems pretty clear you can improve that decision. So I do think common disease will be, um, there will be genomic components that really help common disease. But I actually think the case is stronger, far stronger for rare disease and for cancer. The case is clear cut for me and for rare disease and cancer. Whereas the case for common disease, we've still got some pretty thorny research questions that we've got to get through. Mart wants to ask, and he has his own microphone. Oh, wow. That's right, yes. So <clears throat> I'm curious to, to, to ask, uh, what do you think about the Nordic initiative in molecular medicine, ah. which uh, has been M uh, EMBL affiliated? Yes. Is Fame. it, in your opinion, a fruitful program? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think, so the Nordics have always had such an amazing tradition of great um, cohorts and genetics, and in particular, FIM, I think, has just been outstanding. Um, I don't actually know that the pan Nordicness has necessarily. So, taking a step back, all the old Viking nations, putting the UK in as a Viking nation, okay? All the old, <laughs> all the old Viking nations are the places that do this best. Yeah? If, you, if you look, Iceland, UK, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, well, Estonia, uh, as a, you know, ruled by Vikings from Sweden uh, for some period of time. So, so that, that's, this set of countries is by far, you know, five to ten years ahead of the rest of the world in exploring all of this. I think, you know, could we do more in coordination? Probably. But I think you've also got to recognize how much further ahead all of these countries are compared to everywhere else. So I, I, I you know, can we go further up the mountain? Yes. But we also need to turn around and look how far up the mountain we've come um, already. And from that perspective, I would, you know, if there was a word for old Viking nation, I would, I would, that's the, the boundary I would draw across that. We have a question in here. 
Thanks for the great talk. Um, it's been a slightly maybe disturbing trend, especially in the US, of kind of uh, research data moving into private clouds and also sometimes with paid access or requester based access. Uh, so first, kind of what do you think about this trend? And the other thing is, do you think we'll be able to kind of resist this yeah. in Europe? I mean, uh, th you're, you're kind of making a pointed GTEx question, are you there? Uh, Google Clouds and Google. Yeah. GTEx is one of them. The other has been individual researchers putting their like some number summer level data into yeah, request yeah. base. So I, I mean, I do think so. So here, I think one needs to remind ourselves again how lucky molecular biology is that we have culturally come to a global agreement that when you publish a paper, you deposit your data. Yeah, you don't do that in chemistry. The American Society of Chemistry holds the data, they charge for it, it's all messy and annoying, yeah? And, and this system where we not only share our knowledge, but we also share the data that underlies that knowledge is, is a very, very good thing that we should defend for molecular biology. And it's very important we do it on the point of publication. It's not when you generate the data, it's when you publish the data. So you can throw it out, change it, whatever, you get the credit, all of those things. I'm not suggesting that we we just share data immediately as they come off the machines and stuff like that. So I'm, I've got a real passion for, for doing that and doing it globally. And that's why at the EBI, when we store data, we store it for everyone and we will distribute it for everyone. Now there is this practicality of scaling and some people will say, um, well, the only way you can do this is by charging either for deposition or for access. I actually don't think that's the right economic model. Um, I think our wise member states, of which Estonia will be one, will make, is, is in a much better place when, um, when we pay for it kind of once as a piece of infrastructure. So I think it's better to think of it as roads and railways where, where the state has to lay out a certain amount of stuff. You drive private cars across it, but nobody spends your time charging you for every bit of road that you go, you go across. But I, c I do understand why people either pragmatically make different decisions or think that it's, we have to win that argument. So uh, in the case of GTEx, um, when the Americans said, well, you have to, we're not gonna, you know, you have to pay, we did ask the Americans whether, um, whether it was okay that we distributed it from the EBI, and they did say yes, which was great. So that's good. But there is a, we still got a long term question there. Let me just go on two other legal aspects, because this is a scale aspect and a money aspect. Obviously, when we have human data, like the rules are different. So people, the people who can get access to Estonian data, it must go through an Estonian process. And probably the data should never leave Estonia. Uh, and I think that's totally fair. And I mean, Estonia, it's, it's for Estonians and Estonian processes to decide who gets access to which data sets by whatever process they think is the right thing. Probably involve consent forms, some other things, lots of other pieces along that business. And to say, oh, you must deposit your data somewhere else, you, you know, the, the, legal, the legal structures and the ethics trump the scientific. Um, cultural norm there, obviously. We actually have another area here that's coming up, which is Nagoya, the Nagoya Treaty. I don't know if you've come across this. This is biodiversity. And it's just been, agree it's been agreed for a very long time that the country owns all the samples that are within the country. The country gets to decide whether biological material can be sent outside of the country. You can't just go to Brazil, cut down bits of rainforest, take them back to the UK and make drugs from, from the plants and, and not tell the Brazilian authorities. That is illegal. We have an international treaty that says that's illegal. That has been extended to data, or is being extended to data. And that is gonna make life really complicated for us because now the, if there's a jaguar in Brazil and you got the 
samples from the Jaguar now in Brazil. It's for a Brazilian process to decide whether the Jaguar genome gets uploaded or not, or whether the Jaguar proteome gets uploaded. Now, thankfully, Jaguars do move between different countries, so you, you can probably find a, a scenario where you can, you can do this. But it's actually it, it's similar to human ethics, but, but in, a, in a slightly more complicated scenario. It's another scenario where, we, where we'll probably have access controls through this legal mechanism. So I don't think, although I think we should maintain the business for like laboratory mice for sure, the data should be shared with the world, and that should be a standard, and we should continue to do it. I can see why we'll have different discussions in different settings for the practicalities of scale and funding it, which I hope to win, yeah? For the human legal questions, their human legal ethics trumps everything else and the legalities, and for this biodiversity Nagoya question, we're gonna to have to handle that. Yeah, we have here uh, a senior research council uh, head of that, and, and we have the Nagoya question uh, on every mathematics grant as well. So we have to answer those on the grant. What, on the, uh, what, not How the, we the comply to Nagoya process. Yeah, have <laughs> you? <laughs> and you tick it, presumably, um, on the mathematics might. grant. <laughs> Talking about dreams. Um, you said that, um, uh, that, for example, Estonian Biobank should be governed by Estonian, uh, well, the state of Estonia. Yeah. But if we go a little bit further, wouldn't it um, be possible that, that uh, indiv individual level data would be actually governed by the person, not uh, cutting out the state uh, as, yeah. a, uh, so as I, yeah. So, indeed, potentially, but the state has to everybody has to do things which are legal in their country. And in some countries, they pass this, they, they, they take pride in empowering individuals to make some of these decisions. Most notably, the United States absolutely says, you know, if it's inside of my body, it's mine. Absolutely nobody else's. Uh, so that's a country that really empowers that, those individual decisions. And then I will go to my favorite, well, I shouldn't say favorite, one of the lovely uh, old Viking countries, Denmark, where this, this old Viking law, which is that if you, if you get benefits from the Danish healthcare system, that has been generated from decades of research and work from other people's data. And so you coming and using the healthcare system, you have to sort of, you're implicitly signing up for your data being used to improve healthcare in the future as well. So that's the way the Danish law is a long time written. There's no doubt, I suspect, there's some Estonian law that's not a million miles away from it. I don't know the details. So there, the state is making a decision, not about the individual, but the choices that you made by going to the healthcare system, the Danish healthcare system. And from the Danish perspective, you have made a choice. You could not have gone to the healthcare system. You could have gone somewhere else uh, to, do, to do that. But in some sense, in, I mean, certainly in practice, Absolutely in practice. I mean, there's a kind of philosophical question about which of these approaches are right. In practice, whatever you do must be legal in the country that you do it in. And there's no getting around that. So again, it comes down to Estonians making decisions about how Estonians behave and the data. And that might be a very collective decision, or it might be a, we trust our, you know, a very, a very individual decision even then, the, the place that, where that decision is made is, is by, by an Estonian government. But your human evolution is much broader than Estonian human evolution, right? You have to get access to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I think we have to uh, stop uh, in here for, for time being with the uh, questions to Yuvan. After the event, we will have still uh, outside some catering and we can still have discussions but we would need to switch gears to our next distinguished speaker. Thank you, Yuvan, so much. <laughs>